Welcome everyone and thank you for listening in to Being With, a podcast series produced by the Biennale of Sydney as part of our 23rd edition Rivers. Before we begin, I would like to take time to acknowledge the many different countries we connect from today. I come to you from Wangal country. I acknowledge the traditional custodians of these lands, waters and skies, the Wangal of the Eora Nation and elders past, present and emerging. I extend this acknowledgement to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander friends here with us today. I would also like to take this opportunity to highlight the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people's spirit, imagination and rich history of storytelling and artistic practice that is an ongoing inspiration to me personally and our team at the Biennale of Sydney. So my name is Leah Smith and I am the Curator of Programs and Learning at the Biennale of Sydney. I'm delighted to be here today with Biennale participant Jamana Amil Aboud. Jamana was born in 1971 in Nazareth, occupied Palestinian territories. She lives and works in London, England and Jerusalem, occupied Palestinian territories. Jamana uses drawing, video, performance, objects and text to navigate themes of memory, loss and resilience. Her interests lie in oral histories, the investigation of personal and collective stories and mythologies, particularly folk tales and their sites of being and unbeing. Her work has often reflected a Palestinian cultural landscape in which the struggle for continuity amidst the wider political context necessitates a constant process of metamorphosis and ingenuity. Before we sink into conversation with Jamana, I will share a brief curatorial note on Being With. Being With features local and international voices from across our exhibition program. It aims to shed light on the rich and diverse relationships we hold with nature, science and technology through facilitating a deep dive into rich and ongoing creative and conceptual practices that span art, design, environmentalism and activism. Through Being With, we aim to demystify interspecies communication and connection through moving between micro and macro environments. Ancestral and futuristic knowledge systems and cultural practices will be discussed as tools for understanding how these relationships are and furthermore can be nurtured. Being with is a beautiful reminder that amidst a global pandemic, we are never truly alone. Jemana will commence today's session with a story a performative reading, providing a rich insight into her community and her place through narrative. Jamana and I will then hold space together as we delve into the essence of today's podcast, Being With Community, through a discussion of Jamana's reading. The conversation will be porous, exploring elements such as time, cultural knowledge, and the politicized nature of water through community. It will be grounded in the words of Jamana, My work is nothing without the community and the communities that inspire it. It's my great pleasure to now hand over to Jamana. Thank you, Leah, and thank you to everyone at Sydney Biennial. Water Walks, chapter one, in which I'm the voice of Imjuma, reflecting on our walk on a hillside in Ain Kenya village. They were thieves and criminals hiding, she begins, hiding in the cave. They had their guns. He took his gun and where was his wife? His wife, Sophie, stayed at the wedding celebration, obeying his words, her husband's words, to remain and to make it as if everything was all right. But nothing was all right. Her sons had been slain, all four of them. He took his gun and knew where to find them. How did he know where to find them? Abdul Jabbar, Sophia's husband, knew where to find them, and he went after them. Look, do you see the lemon seller? Is that his car? No, no, that's not him. The criminals arrived at the cave and hid. I've come for you, Abdul Jabbar warned. And then, my dear, with God's strength, peace be upon him. He shot them dead, all four. 
He returned home and comforted his wife. But now, when it's time for us to go to Hajj, he told, his, he told her, Um Juma continued, don't curse the people of Ain Kenya. His wife didn't listen to Abdul Jabbar's request. Her heart was filled with sorrow and revengeful spirit. As she reached the Prophet, peace be upon him, the sacred pilgrimage, she made a plea, a curse upon the village of Ain Kenya. May there remain no more than 70 persons living inside it. No more than 70 pomegranates to pluck above the 70 branches of 70 hearts. O oh, mother, for me they've sharpened their knives and cursed my land. For me they've cursed the land and fed me no more than 70 pieces of bread. It's December, no, July. It's chilly, no, it's warm. We cross. It's a rundown paved street that we cross, and we make our way down a short and steep drop passing the Ayn al-Balad, which means the spring of the country. We make our way down and then up, and then up, and from there, we'd continue to climb up with our final destination aiming for the what is supposed to be the main source of the water, Ayn Abul Atham or Ayn Imla Yun. Before reaching the source, we would be passing three other water sources that are directly linked to it. So in a way, we were beginning at the end. Ayn al Balad is the last visible destination of the water from Ayn Imla Yun which means the mother of all eyes. As they returned home, they found all the people of Ayan Kenya village. They found them all dead. Imagine such a curse, she said to me. I'm breathing heavily as we continue to walk up the hill. I'm thinking that I don't understand why God would fulfill such a curse. I forget to ask her the question and we continue walking. I'm not one to speak on God's behalf out here in this piece of time or place of time. But I do wonder, did God believe that Sophia was justified in her asking? To this day, no more than 70 persons live in Ain Kenya. There are roughly 1,100 persons living here today, the service bus driver tells me, with fireworks blasting in the open skies to mark the pride and success of high school exam results, il tawjihi which in Arabic means to direct or direction. Her husband, furious that she, was, that she would even think to curse an entire village and to, to go against uh, his wishes, as if to make up for her own loss. In return, her husband would put a curse on her, for it is the will of God. You banish the innocent in your quest for revenge. May your own flesh fall off your bones. Days came and days went, and this woman's flesh, Sophie, it fell from her bones until she passed away. And this was the end of her story. We continued to walk. My grandmother told me the story as she lived it a hundred years ago. She used to say, look at this oak tree, it's not good. Let me carry your bag. She used to say, and at the time the occupation began, how many countries have been occupied? How many occupiers have fallen? Remember how many have ruled over Palestine? Many, oh, so many. She used to say, this occupation now, through God's will, through the will of God, inshallah, shall be the last. I'm curious who may follow, what will return. I'm curious about the possession of waters by spirits. Will they return? And I may ask her, where is the end of their story? Shomar, fennel, skirts our pathway. Lemons, it seems to me, are always in season here. When we reached Ayn Imiruman, the spring of the mother of pomegranates, where the hillside is always fertile and green, despite the dry and rocky pathway, I don't recognize any herbs or berries or plants here, I'm always learning. Here, you take this and your throat infection will be cured. We pass Hashkanan's garden, which is gated to keep out the wild boars. 
I've been inside his garden and I've seen how he uses the water from the spring to feed his grafting tree experiments. It's the water of the pomegranate of mothers, or is it the Roman conquerors, the Roman conquerors, or the gypsy waters? Which water is it? Are we lost in thousand-year-old translations, or are we revealed in the names of their remembering? But now I'm in Hashkanan's garden. What will happen after his passing, I wonder? Who will inherit his knowledge of the earth's happiness? Some have burned the earth, scorched the borders of their territory in order to prevent fires, snakes, scorpions. We come upon two women resting from the climb. Peace be upon you, peace be upon you. Seated as they are out in the open, upon a massive slab of stone, they appear to me majestic, seated on their thrones. Eyebrows drawn in dark and thin tattooed line gracing her face, we arrive at the kaikop, the maple Greek strawberry. It's at least a thousand, year old, a thousand years old. I must remember to ask a Shirak sunrise to confirm this age. Here is his grave, the first of the property owners. You see the earth where we shall all return? We came to pray here. We brought him candles. Inside, we find traces where oil was preserved. A clay pot stood here. We're inside the small dwelling, cave-like. God Almighty, they took what they could find. Abul Nijim is here, the man of stars. It's here he is buried. He's the property owner. And Abul Ainain, the man of eyes, he lived in times before. He was the holy person. And it's believed that he spirited this water source, this place. I heard that a man from the village proclaimed he would cease to light candles for the holy man. There was a reason. What was the reason? A young woman hiding in the cave from her attackers was not protected. It was his duty, the spirit of the spring, to protect her, but he did not. If you observe the multiple branches of the maple, almost tentacle-like, twisting pale crimson, you may believe you may believe that an oil lamp was found in the mouth of a wolf lying by the spring, wolf that was sacrificed for faith of haunted spirit. They dressed in white like angels. They appeared to the thieves and thieves ran away in fright. The Kaikop, the maple. Others who passed by before us have engraved their names and the names of their lovers on the surface of the maple. Why do we write our names into the trees, drawing our heart-shaped outlines with initials inside them? After a pause, Mjuma confides that as a child, she was passing by the tree with her grandmother when she hears unidentifiable, unidentifiable sounds. During that time, the holy side of the spring wasn't abandoned or dried out as it is now. Hammaru, she says to me, which means the sound of humming in Arabic. Hammaru, the sound hummed at us six times like this. Hum, hum, hum. Onions were regularly planted here, she continues to tell us. The wild loof, the arum palestinium, this plant naturally growing across the hill is medicinal, curing all forms of cancer. Dry it and boil it and drink from it. Drink from its miracle. Be aware of its spiciness. I later tried this medicinal remedy and I found it so bitter that I couldn't drink it. Pointing to another green leaf, palm-sized and rooted to the earth. And this is the tufu leaf which is the Jerusalem sage. It's delicious as stuffed vine leaves. In a world where time did not stand still, we were free from diseases, living from the earth's secrets and waters as we did, free. We hung manadil, scarves, across the oak tree's branches, Abu Lajame, Abu Nijim, near the holy sites and springs. And then the uprising came and our sense of security and our heritage ways 
were maneuvered in alternative directions, maybe even enforced, or maybe not even, even. We pass by the young man guarding the spring. He's an animal talker. I've witnessed his command of the animals. The other one, the other guardian, Joseph, he's a craftsman of the earth. His knowledge on the hidden springs and his protection of them births a new form of possessiveness. He's the last of his kind, water, diviner, and protector. Sayyid al-Qasr, the man who sits on the throne. As we continue to ascend the hills, the first to be aware of our presence are the birds and the hissing grasshoppers. We don't see them, but we hear them. As we, as we move past them, rocks and fallen branches, rocks moved and turned over by falling rainwater, but there's no rainwater now. Every season has its offering. We stop for water and I attempt not to fall. Every time I walk through here between one spring to another, I see the elusive formations of faces in the rocks and bushes as fantasies formed in the mind's eye. I'm pleased you see the formations also, even if they are different from the ones I see. Horses, human faces, wolves, rabbits, owls. Above us in the sky, Airplanes have resumed their tracks, invading empty surfaces, new ones, for they never used to cross like this in such sound and quantity. When such planes moved across the sky over us, all manners of creatures on the land compete with the monstrous roar of the airplane. Roosters, donkeys, birds, even the wind suddenly makes its presence known across the face of our masked silences. I'm collecting small stones along the way, conscious and feeling guilty as I do so, for, for perhaps it's not my place to move them out, carry them between my fingers. I admire their resilience and their connectedness to the earth of time. Much like the ant before me now, carrying five times its body weight in the shell of a sunflower seed. It's only water that has shaped these stones, these footed, footprinted, foot. It's only water that has shaped these stones, these footprinted plant-grown hills and rocks. It's only water and its collaboration with time through God's will. The sound of the water inside the enclave, the well, it is a well, the main source when we finally reach it, several hours have passed. Uh, all I hear is the wind. Yes, there's no sound of water. I hear the wind as well. We shout out our names into the womb of the well deep. We hear our own voices rippling in the gaps of the water's belly. Oh, my body is free. Free as the bird that's flying. Free as the golden bush freed by the rays of the sun. Oh, my body is free, just as the spirit is willed. Freed through the flowing of water, coming from the springs of time and free from the feet of time, freed forever in memory. Thank you so much, Jamana, for reading this for us. Um, gosh, it's so nice to hear a story being read out loud. Um, I think it's so rare as well, um, yeah, to be able to listen like that. So I'm incredibly grateful for that gift. It's so beautiful. Um, I guess now it might be a nice time for you to sort of introduce yourself and share for our listeners where you connect to us from. Thank you, Leah. So I am currently based in Jerusalem, occupied Palestinian territories. And um, I want to also acknowledge where this story and where this um, performative poem uh, was written it was inspired by my last maybe 12 months uh, uh, spending it in the hillside of the village of Ain Kenya, um, in the, um, hosted by Saki, an institution called Saki Art Science Agriculture. 
Mm -hmm. The Ain Kenya is located just seven kilometers west of Ramallah. And it's mostly an area sea land. And um, just to give a little bit of a background in terms of the space, because it really is very relevant to the story um, and and my work and uh, the inspiration and also the division, not just of the land, but also of the water. Mm -hmm. So area A, B and C are how um, the West Bank territory was negotiated following um, the Oslo administration from 1993. And while the Palestinian Authority administers educational and medical responsibility of Palestinians in Area C, so Ain Kenya is in Area C, the infrastructure construction is ruled or governed or limited by the Israeli Authority. Mm -hmm. And so what that means is that the, the um, Palestinians are denied building in Area C, although they are living um, in and and. Techni not technically, but historically have right um, to the land, mm. but they're denied building uh, on that land right. and, um, and developing it. Mm. So, but at the same time, Israel grants uh, full Israeli settlement expansion on the same land, on the area sea land. Mm. And so skirting right around the area of the Rankinia village are um, these Israeli settlements. Um, kind of lurking um, from their watchtower hilltops. They're quite, usually they're quite at the top. Um, the settlements are built at the top of hills. Mm. And um, so they're not only illegally um, developed there, but on the land, but they're also at the same time thieving in some, in some ways from the natural water sources mm. uh, and denying it to the Palestinian um, uh, owners of the land. Mm. So I, I, you know, so for for the last year, I spent a lot of time. A lot of it was spent in solitude um, in the hillside of the Hankinia uh, village, and also letting myself sort of be seen by the villagers, by the Palestinian villagers, so that we can begin to establish some form of trust. Because I'm not from there, and I'm trying to. I wanted to work with them and I am aware as an artist that I can't just jump into this this community this very fragile situation mm. and you know pull out what I expect um, in fact at the time I had whatever expectations I had um, you know they're completely I think it's misleading to have expectations actually to go in there mm. but one one of the things I, I will just um, say uh, is that it really is, um, it really was a privilege to work with uh, the villagers um, of Ain Kenya after time and after gaining, and we're continuing to establish that trust, mm. and also to um, to be hosted by Saki, and, um, and the Saki are, uh, again, just to say briefly, they're attempting to rewild one part of the hillside, mm. which is owned by a Palestinian family, the Zalatimo family. Mm -hmm. And so it's it's really with thanks to them, both the Zalatimo family and Saki Art Science Agriculture, mm. and um, the more than uh, 70 um, inhabitants of Ankinia village <laughs> that I owe my thanks um, over this last year. Mm. So this is just really to situate where yeah. the inspiration for the story um, came from. Yeah, I mean, that was something that I was, you know, I, I was very lucky to have been able to read this, um, you know, prior to today's session, that that was something that I was, when I was hearing you read out loud, it was something that I was sort of imagining. And I, and I wanted to know so much more about this place and the people that um, are from this place. Thank you for sort of grounding us in that space. Um, I, I, as you said, it's, it's really critical for our understanding and to be able to sort of um, better, better connect to the types of um, issues and, and ideas that you're exploring both through this piece of writing, but also more broadly through your practice. Um, yeah, so I mean, when I was, when I was reading and listening to your story, I was really struck by three core elements. Um, Time feels incredibly expansive to me. I mean, also hearing you kind of labor over the words, like there's a beautiful um, tension between the, yeah, the one word to the next and that those pauses feel so significant. Um, and that really, I guess, helps with the flow and the evolution of the story. 
and also this sense of walking, um, you know, which is something that I've been really, you know, I think many of us have been doing a lot of during COVID, but something that I've been really reflecting on is how conversation shifts when you are walking with somebody or when you're sort of like leisurely laying in a park with somebody, you know, like it really shifts the pace and the development of communication and, and in this case, the flow of the narrative. But also, you know, there are these really strong characters in your story that are sort of really gifting us um, these really beautiful cultural insights into knowledge that they hold. And so I'm just wondering whether I know that these are quite big, you know, ideas and concepts and they, they too are quite sprawling. But, you know, whether within the context of this story, you could perhaps unpack, you know, what these sorts of words mean to you, time, walking and cultural knowledge. Thank you, Leah. Yeah, time, walk, and cultural knowledge. These are beautiful, um, beautiful comments. Thank you for your reflection. And I mean, these three elements, I believe, exist in the stories that we tell um, today and in our past. I'm very much inspired by the oral history, the Palestinian oral traditions that I feel very fortunate um, and blessed to have um, had the um, the chance to be told these stories in my childhood, and I believe I was the last uh, from the you know my generation might be might have been the last to have had the stories being uh, shared with them. Mm. Um, very often, the stories would have been shared from um, by women, the storytellers, and and very often the story um, not just the storytellers but also the story creators. Mm. and um, attempting to um, not entertain but really to teach and to offer mm. us a form of learning or a form of knowledge of the landscapes that we inhabit together mm. with other entities including water and all other entities that also feed or need to live from that water. So the story has always connected us mainly with the landscape and the water sources and um, uh, and also they connected us with um, other uh, beings, human and non-human, living and past um, or living among us in more spirit form, let's say, whether mm. they were holy persons or whether they were spirits from um, other worlds or other domains mm. kind of guarding these water sources. So very often we were told, for example, uh, not to go near a water source sometimes because uh, we were told at the time of our childhood that it would have been haunted mm. by a spirit who, you know, uh, um, might kidnap us. And of course, we understand we rebelled and therefore we went to the water source. But um, we understood later that there, you know, there was um, a sort of a moral intention in these stories, as well as a, a, a warning that, you know, they're afraid our parents and our aunts and our, our at least my, my mother, my aunts, my grandmother, the one that, you know, the ones who told me the story, who shared these stories and, and their knowledge with me and with my sisters, um, they were afraid for us. They didn't want us to go near the water source because it was literally in the wild. Mm. There was a lot more uh, freedom of movement uh, when we lived in the villages and mm. you didn't need to, we obviously, you know, didn't have it, um, to stay indoors. Um, and, and very often a friend and I joke how we were raised not just by our human kind of blood relatives, but we were raised by the, the spirited relatives, you know, the spirit mm. relatives who include the holes uh, and the water sources and the spirits that are guarding these uh, water sources in various forms. So even, you know, um, we were told that um, you could see these spirit forms because they would appear to you to men they would appear as they would appear as brides women but <laughs> and and you know and to and to others um, they would appear in animal form and mm. the animals weren't uh, fairy taleish animals they they didn't take the form of a unicorn or or a dragon they the animals that um, we were told inhabited uh, the spirits that inhabited the waters in animal form um, were chickens, roosters, donkeys, dogs, cats, 
You know, they were really animals that we would see in our yeah. daily lives. And so that also, um, that also created a different relationship and, and different association to how we looked at animals around us who also inhabited um, the same landscape as we did. And um, yeah, so I think that for me, the, the walking, there are two forms of walking, and that's what I'm really trying to um, explore in the story um, mm. that I've just told. There is that form of walking, which is the physical, that mm. I'm physically taking with Imjuma and several others. Um, and we are walking up a hillside and we are physically attempting to find the water source. This part of the story is real because the characters in the story are not, all of them, they're not real. You know, some of them are fictional coming from these folk tales that we were told. Mm. And I'm hearing Umshuma share such a story that she grew up on. So this is not a story, this is a story that is very specific to Ayn Kenya, to the village of Ayn Kenya. Mm. And certain stories are like that. They mm. walk you through a specific uh, place, mm. uh, such as Ayn Kenya or other villages or other water sources. Mm. And other stories will walk you through um, a more expansive or wider view of the world that you inhibit to get, inhabit together with animals and um, uh, spirits. Mm. and other humans as well. So these yeah. are the kind of the forms of walking that I'm um, that I'm interested in and um, and and I'm interested in exploring, yes, where is that cultural knowledge which came so uh, which was enriched by the oral traditions and the power of these oral traditions and and their and the knowledge is that they um, were very much embedded in passing the story. So mm. that the story was only as as um, as uh, powerful. I you know I don't want to know. I don't want to say powerful, but it was. It could only be alive. The story could only be alive if it's passed from one person to the next. So it, it it's a process always of continuity. So even the story has its own form of walking, um, mm. and therefore its own kind of uh, association with time. Because yeah. the minute that I'm passing you a story that my great aunt shared with me, um, uh, you know, 30 years ago, uh, or longer than that, but the, the minute that I'm sharing a story with you, then you're now sharing that story, or you're thinking, how does the story relate to where you are and your, you know, uh, experience of walking and mm. your experience of time. Mm. And then you may share that story with someone else. So the story is only alive in as much as we're able to talk up, to, to share it and to speak it. Mm. And, um, and it's the same with the water source. Because these uh, stories were told and narrated around um, the water source, they uh, always help to uh, maintain, to keep the water source alive as well. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I mean, it's so interesting because my brain is just like <laughs> going around in circles because, I mean, even when you're talking, I'm kind of going on this journey with you and it's funny that you mention... Um, you know, that through my own reading of that story or my own listening of that story that then I'm then applying or thinking through what these words mean to me that I've pulled out or identified as um, core um, elements. Um, but, yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, when you were just talking about um, these protective tales in a way, um, this was a conversation that I had with um, another um, a Bundjalung group of weavers um, based in northern New South Wales, um, Casino Wake Up Time, and they were talking about a, a water spirit story, the Durangan, and it was a similar kind of tale. It was like, don't go near the water source. And a colleague of mine was saying that she was told a very similar story when she was young. And it was just, yeah, it was always to be mindful of your, your place in the landscape, um, but to also, I don't know, somewhat still encourage that sense of curiosity and investigation, as you said, that you are learning with and in the environment, you know, and that there is no sort of sense of dislocation, that you are part of that landscape. Um, yeah, and I mean, my, my partner is from India and he was recently telling me about a, you know, a tale that he was often told as a child with the banyan tree, um, you know, they're always told not to sleep under the banyan tree because ghosts sort of like live there, occupy that at night. 
But it's that, yeah, I mean, the banyan tree expels carbon dioxide. And so if you're laying underneath it, it's really difficult to breathe at night. Um, but yeah, I mean, just kind of thinking through all of these, um, the way that this, yeah, I love that you also talk about um, these stories, not as entertainment, but as a source of yeah teaching um, and sort of learning and sharing. And I, and I love that it sort of feels... Um, very intimate in the sense that it can be kind of gifted in this kind of way one-on-one, -on -one, but also a more communal space that is kind of held and shared together. Um, that enables your imagination to roam as well. Like as much as you're kind of talking about them being located in place, um, that, yeah, I guess it's quite, it's quite exciting to be sort of, uh, yeah, envisioning these landscapes when I've never experienced it before, but seeing it through these words or understanding it through the way that you describe it. Wow. Yeah. yeah. I, th I, I think that it also, there's, there's two things as well. That the, I think that the power of words for us and the use of the Arabic language as well is, is very significant because many of the springs, the water sources, mm. the Palestinian villages or sites, whether they are holy or not, are um, their names have been changed since the uh, formation of the state of Israel, and the and this kind of change of the names means that our association to them becomes more and more or less and less strong. You know, it mm. it, it kind of cre creates distance when we can no longer identify the the original name of the place and this mm. is why when i'm trying to share these stories i'm i'm very adamant in my kind of um uh insistence i'm very insistent on the names of the springs and even if they have more than one name it there are still names that i want to share and and explore and even question mm. and um and that's one one thing and another is that True, the stories were not always for entertainment, but definitely they were as well. So mm -hmm. that yeah. they they brought to our lives so much joy, and mm -hmm. and and I believe and I feel that that's the one thing that I feel is missing from our relationship with the landscape today: the celebratory, the ritual, the joy, and that's what the stories um, uh, gifted us with. You know, whether we were frightened or not, there were many times uh, that I felt frightened of, of, you know, my, do I go near this tree because it's believed that it's haunted or inhabited by a spirit? Or do I go near that? Do I drink from this water source mm. because the spirit might be angry or not? You know, <laughs> it, it taught me to really, it taught us to actually um, to be very um mindful not just of the spirits but also or the other inhabitants of the landscape but also to look after its care like to take care of it to take care mm. of the site so mm. that we ensured that it we didn't take too much water we ensured that we didn't pollute with you know we did with our plastic or with our garbage so it it, it definitely was a, a huge learning experience for us um, mm. uh, as children. But more than that, it was really a, a joyous experience for us to live within the landscape. Um, mm. And that's the one thing that I feel is so, there is such a huge void of this now because mm. of the intensive, enforced, aggressive, very often aggressive, uh, um, association with the landscape and the water sources today, um, mm. ever more fragile, ever more frail, and and ever more politicized, and so it creates, uh, um, you know, a kind of a, a, we we become more concentrated on the the political narrative and the relationship with our relationship with the landscape, and we move away from the oral tradition. Mm. Um, and, and, you know, what did the oral tradition teach us? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's such a perfect segue into, um, the next question, which kind of talks about water in the story as a character or as having its own, you know, distinct personality. Um, and what I noticed when I was sort of reading it was that water was often connected to words that I'm hearing you, um, speak even now, um, such as spirits and gypsies and source and shaping stones. And there's this real embedded sense of 
mysticism and wonder. Um, and so I'm just, yeah, I mean, I think we're kind of moving into this um, direction, but I'm just curious if you'd like to just speak a little bit more about, you know, water in relation to, um, you know, your community and the place that you live. And I, I really love that you've kind of too acknowledged um, you know, the, the power in using like Arabic and kind of reclaiming that language so that those associations between the story and the source are then kind of reconnected as opposed to them being separate or outside or other. Yeah, I'm, I mean, yes, I've, Thank you. It's really vital. I mean, imagine if someone, you know, called you by some by another name because that's they just decided to. It's yeah, just, yeah. It's not. It's not right. <laughs> um, and you know, I think just to follow through with your with our conversation, yes, the landscape all across the world, not just in Palestine, has been and continues to be um, politicized. It's one of the, you know, we talk also briefly before we mentioned the word imagination. And I think we can also even elaborate more on this because, you know, the politics, I don't want to say that the, the politicization of the water and our access to it is without imagination because there is a claim of, which is the religious claim to the land, right? And that also comes from mm. imagination. Sure. So I think it's a very tricky site to tread in and mm. and to um and, which is why my work generally isn't specific to today um mm. but kind of it i i wish to kind of un you know unfold the 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 map of time let's say so that it's not so much linear and and um and that's why within the story i really do go back and forth between today and yesterday and and you know other uh, kind of um yeah other references um but for example if you're living in a place where the government of this place holds that even the rainwater is theirs and so that Traditionally, every Palestinian home, for example, uh, or homes were had one common water well. There was several homes shared one uh, one water well, and water was collected from the rain. And today, this is impossible because if the rainwater is um, no longer your property, let's say, uh, then you cannot use it. You cannot share mm -hmm. it with yeah. you know your community and the one um there's one water source that we do walk through and that's the the water of um, the mother of pomegranates which is you know also sometimes referred to as the garden spring or the um the, the water spring of the garden and the reason that they 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 give it also different names is because nobody really knows where the name originated, whether it it's comes from the word gypsy or from the Roman um, travelers, mm. and and I find this really interesting. It's not that I I want to erase um, the previous histories. It's more of there are these other stories being told. There are these other narratives, whether or not they they may they may be Palestinian or not, whether they may be Arab or whether they may be Jewish. I believe that there was this kind of interwoven narratives, especially um, in Palestine, and mm. there was this you know religious association and continues to be a religious association to the land, mm. but to a certain extent, this religious association of the land was has been manipulated mm. so um, so that it can serve political um, purpose mm. and it can you know it can claim that the rainwater is ours because of such and such. Um, whereas in the past, the water source was first and foremost, um, or the rainwater was first and foremost, um, you know, it came from God and was ruled by God. Yeah. And this connection, not just to the land, but the, the connection or the water, we had a stronger connection to the, um, the divine, let's mm. say. You know, whether it was a, a, a Jewish or a Catholic or a Muslim divinity, mm. we all shared a common um, um, praise and acknowledgement of the divine. Mm. And not a, a, 
again, not the, not the divine that is, not the narrative of the divine that is now used in order to feed political uh, narratives. It yeah. was a different kind of, of a divine, a divine that connected us to the landscape and to each other and to the water source. And that's where it's, it's very different. I don't know if I've yeah. answered your question. I feel that no, sometimes no. I... <laughs> no, no, I mean, it doesn't matter. Like, it, it can just flow like water, right? <laughs> I mean, it yeah. I think, um, yeah. yeah, I mean, I think that what you're touching on is really interesting. And yeah, I mean, when you sort of talk about divine, I guess I think of like, yeah, a spiritual sensibility, but then it too kind of circles back in my mind to these ideas of like respect and care, you know, whether it's for <laughs> each other or the elements or the environment it's like if you have this kind of greater philosophy that sort of grounds you then I don't know yeah these borders or these points of division intersection don't seem to be as significant as what they are today mm -hmm. because we sort of live in this highly polarized society and yeah I mean I've not been to Palestine but I, I can only imagine based on what I understand and, and what you're sort of sharing with us today that it's you know it's um yeah, it's a, it's a really sort of concentrated example of that, but we are sort of seeing these types of um, experiences, you know, all over the world at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, it it mm -hmm. is a shared narrative, unfortunately, you know. It's, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. it's awful to yes. think of it in that way. Yes, I mean, it's, it, in a way, we need to think about it in this way mm. because there, there is something which is... Um, if we continue to see only what is different, if we continue to only see divisions, um, our, you know, we approached uh, water without fences. So mm. there was, you know, territory and there was a water source and seven families could and still do share the same water source, such as the Ayn Emerumani, seven families in Ayn Kenya village share this water source and each uh, family shares it so that there's 12 hours within the week that the water source is given to to them to their mm. pot of land let's say mm. and in this in this way this kind of understanding this acknowledgement there is another family and you know they've got another piece of land and they're sharing the same water doesn't just um, and I understand that this water will then return to me means that I'm caring for not just the water, but also the other family and the land. So it, yeah. it, it and, and everything else. And I think that this, and one of the things that, um, and maybe this was my intention when I wrote within the story about, uh, we were talking about occupation and, um, and um, you know, and she's telling me about how her grandmother used to say that there so many have occupied land and it comes and goes. And this got me to thinking of how there are certain elements within our uh, lives and within the landscape that are, and within our, um, um, t within time mm. that are temporary. And mm. there are other elements which are permanent. Mm. So if we cared more about the permanence and less about the temporary, not to say that the temporary isn't to be cared for. It it should be cared for as well. Yeah. You know, I have I have an immediate need that I need to respond to, right? Mm -hmm. And 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 especially in connection to my community. If my community needs water now, this is an immediate need. Yeah. Um, but I think that there are certain elements that are that are uh, temporary, and they just only interrupt our um, richer relationship with each other and with the landscape and, mm. and the other entities living within um, yeah. and holding that space with us. Does that make sense? So it, it, uh, very often I'm thinking of the question, what is eternal? You know, when I mm. go to these, to, these, to these places, and this, again, I feel very blessed and grateful to, to have been working with such beautiful people in the village of Ayn Kenya because their relationship to to the water source today, they're very aware of the temporary, quote unquote, meaning, you know, whatever the government is now and whatever rules there are now and whatever settlement there is around them now. They're very much aware of that. You can't not be aware of that. Mm. But at the same time, they are also very much aware of what is eternal. So what is something that is continu that is continuous? And and that's where the the... the I think that's what keeps them going. 
Um, yeah. I've learned so much from from them, you know, and I and I think that yeah. Um, sorry, my headphone is falling off. No, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, I guess it comes back to like faith in something greater, right? That and that there is hope that. Um, yeah, as you mentioned, that those kind of divisions that are, you know, there to service whatever the political agenda is at the time will hopefully eventually dissolve, you know, at some point. And that then, I don't know, that, yeah, you, you, you have to kind of, I think, hold on to that, that hope that, that there is something, I don't know, that is, that is more equitable, that is, that is more shared, you know, and as you said, that you have, I mean, you know, I think that, you know, in the current, you know, it's funny to kind of talk about the relationship between, um, you know, one member of a community and their sort of like wider neighborhood, because, you know, when you think about where I live here right now, I mean, I, I know my neighbors, I live in an apartment block of nine, but yeah, I think the extent is that we have a shared garden, which just sort of took place a couple of months ago, you know, um, and it's, you know, it's, a, it's an interesting space of, you know, making sure that everyone is um, equally contributing. Um, but, but yeah, like those kind of, I don't know, those, those things that you invest in that are, yeah, that are greater than you, that are greater than, you know, as you mentioned, like your immediate need and, and um, desires that you need to sort of satisfy that. How do you kind of situate yourself beyond that in your place? Um, yeah, I mean, I guess, you know, coming back to the theme of today's podcast, we're talking about being with community. And it's interesting because um, I think prior to having this conversation, I was only really thinking about community as, you know, human relationships, um, kinship with our own species. And, and what I love is that that has been completely um you know, torn down <laughs> for want of a better word, because, you know, of course, as we're, as we're saying, like community is so much bigger than that. And, and I love that you talk about things that are seen and unseen, um, you know, the, the natural landscape that sort of supports us and nourishes us, um, but also kind of these stories that, that hold us and ground us. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I think it would be really nice just to have sort of an insight into, you know, what, what this community means for you, this term, and how you feel it can be enriched. Yeah, community is kinship with all. That, yeah. I think, is the one thing that I would say, which which includes the seen and the unseen, the living and um, past, our ancestors, our past, our heritage. And it, you know, it means community is also acknowledging traditional and heritage uh, ways of culture, but also mm. recognizing that whether it um, necessarily suits your lifestyle today or not, there is still some form of being with that tradition, being with that heritage, recognizing it and, and acknowledging it. That's what I mean by being with. Whether you choose to still continue to live it or not, or whether you can't live within that tradition or not is, is another issue. Mm. Um, but yeah, community is being with the spirit, being with the material. Um, it's acknowledgement of time. And, um, and it's also being caring, not just for the present moment when we speak of time, but it's also caring for the future and what mm. may the future bring. It's being aware of how are we caring for this immediate moment, which acknowledges the past and our ancestors, um, in order to um, offer a hopeful future. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, it's such, a, it's such a beautiful response. I think it might be a nice point now to talk through your project for the 23rd Biennale of Sydney uh, River. So from what I understand, you are presenting a past work um, and I'm curious sort of what the process has been in terms of selecting what you feel would be most appropriate for of us. I mean, there's so many beautiful points of intersection in terms of what the exhibition is about and also, you know, what seems like uh, a long and um, deep relationship with some of these core ideas and themes around collective practice, sustainability, uh, water relations. Um, so yeah, can you, can you please tell us a little bit more about your project that we'll get to experience here in Sydney? Yeah, I'm really excited to be showing and um, to be uh, contributing in what I can um, in the Sydney Biennial. And um, 
I think that with the curators, the selection that we made um, encompasses drawings that are inspired by the folk tales um, that are told around the spirited sites, whether they are water sites or trees um, or caves. Mm. And um, so it's a kind of, a, it's not, some of the um, drawings are looking specifically at one particular story, which is the story of um, orphaned children, a boy and a girl, a sister and a brother, who are lost in, uh, who run away actually, and they are lost in the woods and a bird comes to them and speaks to them and guides them and tells them you could find water, but be careful not to drink from the lower spring, you need to drink from the upper spring. And they continue walking and they find the two sources of water and the boy, the younger brother, he is um, so thirsty, he runs immediately, he forgets the, the advice of the bird and he drinks from the lower spring and upon doing so immediately transforms into a gazelle, a deer. Oh, and his wow. sister cries and cries, but there's nothing that she can do. They continue to walk in the woods, they find a new town and there the handsome prince uh, sees uh, the girl with her with this gazelle kind of always walking one step behind her <laughs> and is, fasc is fascinated by these two creatures and immediately falls in love with them and over time they marry and it's time for him to go to war or to go to Hajj you know there are var mm. variations of the story and the um, the the kind of the helpers in the house are quite jealous of her because you know they always thought why would our prince marry someone who's just coming in from the woods she's unknown she no one knows anything about her and this gazelle so they plot to um, to to kill her and they throw her down a well and they plot to eat the deer her brother <laughs> and oh. uh, with, uh, of course no one knows that it's really her brother. <laughs> And um, but thankfully, what happens is that they um, the brother, every piece of bread that they offer him, he takes it. He doesn't eat it. He shares it with his sister. He throws the bread down the well. Uh -huh. And that's how she's able to survive until her husband returns. And her husband doesn't believe when they've told when they told him that she committed suicide. You know, they, they create the story where his wife was so sad that he left that she killed herself and he doesn't believe it. <laughs> he, he sees the deer. He sees the deer with bread in his mouth and he follows the deer and he sees him throw the bread down the water well and he hears song and you know between the deer and a voice echoing from the well because they're singing to each other and um, and then he recognizes his wife's voice and he Im immediately pulls her out of the well and he finds that she has given birth during this time and oh while God. she was in the well she was, <laughs> she was pregnant and um, and you know many other stories are then formed and formulated you know, that are associated yeah. with the story of what really happened down there <laughs> in the well. Um, and, um, and, then, and then she confesses that, that the deer is really her brother. And he tells her, well, that's, an, that's easy. That's an easy enchantment to cure. He just needs to drink from the same water source. And so he takes him, he drinks from the same water source and immediately the enchantment is broken. Mm. And so a lot of my drawings will be looking at this story and trying to untangle the characters. Who is the sister? Who is the deer? Who, you know, who, what is the well? Um, mm. What is the bread? <laughs> it's not a, a liter, literary interpretation. It's not illustrative in that sense. Mm. I'm not trying in my work for Sydney to, I'm not trying to show um, or to translate a readable explanation of the story. You will not know the story from looking at my work, but you yeah. will see that there is a relationship. There is a brother, there is a sister, there's a dear, um, you know, who, who, who is it? You will see uh, um, uh, a girl who is kind of um, 
sitting by a water well, but you you will not know that is is she a spirit, you know, inhabiting the the, the water well, or is she a human girl um, mm. there sitting by the well? So you will see these figures in the drawings, but you will not know the full story, which mm. is fine because for me it's really important that the fragments are what are transmitted. And it's through these fragments of memory and of story that that we're able to actually preserve um, uh, and care for the stories and their and their water sources. Mm. So when you don't know the full story, I believe, is when you only have it in fragments is when it may have some form of resonance with a story from your own life or from 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 your own um, land or water. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, it's such an interesting story because I'm even just kind of thinking back how it sort of to really um, encapsulate so much of what we've been talking about. Like there's that relationship between the child and the the deer, the animal. And then there's this kind of obviously this water and it's a well. And we've been talking so much about the significance of the well within a community um, and, and I guess to ownership over or like who takes claim of the rain um, yeah, it's, and I and I yeah I really enjoy that there are these. I guess it's like the essence. So you're kind of distilling the core um, features, characters of that story that then kind of reappear in a um, a new mapping, I guess, of of the different yeah points and points of experiences. Um, thank you so much for that insight. It's always so nice to um, to hear you know, a description of a work as opposed to reading, you know, on a wall, like it kind of really comes alive. And now I'm really looking forward. I mean, not that I wasn't before. I was, you know, couldn't wait to see your work in, in real life. Um, I've seen so many images now, but it's going to take on a whole new, um, yeah, form, having this kind of <laughs> grounding that experience. Mm -hmm. Um, final question, um, which I guess is kind of tapping into the podcast today, but also again, more broadly for your project for the Biennale of Sydney next year. What do you hope that our listeners and our audiences will take away from both this podcast, but also their encounter with your work next year? I hope that they're able to see the work inspired by the water folk tales, the Palestinian water folk tales. And to to do two things to first understand the importance of these stories especially for those whose voices are and continue to be silenced and um and i hope that they will be inspired to see these uh, work and hear their stories and their fragments and to offer um i hope that they will offer them hope to continue their own stories in their own lives from wherever they may be or wherever whatever their cultural background um, so that the stories and the works are not specific to Palestine only. So mm. I hope that they will take away um, that. Mm. And um, yeah. <laughs> such a beautiful gift. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jamana. It's a, been such a pleasure spending this time with you. I mean, my evening, your morning. Um, but yeah, you've been so generous and so thoughtful in your responses. And I'm so, yeah, I'm so grateful to have spent this time together, but also to be able to share this conversation more broadly with our listeners who will, you know, I'm sure take so much away from all that you've offered us. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you so much, Leah. Thank you to everyone at the Sydney Biennial. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for listening to Being With, a Biennale of Sydney podcast. To learn more about the 23rd Biennale of Sydney, Rivas, head to biennaleofsydney.art.